Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Lisa, and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> And I think the first thing I want to say is I want to thank Chris for including me in this workshop. Um, it's really an honor to be uh, have the opportunity to do service in this way, and um, hopefully I'll bring you a good message. Um, our topic tonight is uh, practicing the principles of recovery in relationships. And... Um, I guess the reason that we do this, I mean, we've, you know, already covered steps one through 12, and then these are, you know, we're getting into, uh, the chapters two wives and the family afterward. That's what we're gonna basically, um, the principles are gonna come out of those two chapters. And, um, the reason that that's so important is that, at least, I, I don't know if, if you would agree with this, but at least in my experience that, um, and I think they talk about it in the 12 and 12, is that the inability to maintain a relationship with another person is the root of our alcoholism. So, yes, it's great to be in relationships. I mean, realistically, we're in relationship with something all the time, whether it's a person or a job or or a, 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 a room, a chair. Any, we're in relationship all the time, and it's great, and we, we sort of take it for granted. But for alcoholics, it's really important that we get get clear on what that's all about because if it don't, if we don't, it will kill us eventually, one way or the other. Um, so I think, you know, they call these chapters, they call them the forgotten chapters, and a lot of times they're sort of dismissed because um, they're considered Al-Anon work. Um, my experience has been, again, and I'm just going to speak from my experience, I mean, <laughs> I'm talking about relationships and recovery, and I'm by far me, and no, no expert, um, so just because I'm up here doesn't mean I'm an expert, but the book does say that um, our way will be made smoother, and that I've had that experience, so that, that I can definitely share about. Um, but my experience has been that, um, you know, my alcoholism has two sides to it. And when I've gone through the work in the back of the book here, I I see myself in these pages on both sides of the equation. And uh, for me, it's been necessary to look at that very closely because at a certain point, we can only go so far, at least for me, only looking at one side of that. And I'll get into that a little bit more later with some examples. But um, Okay, so the first thing I want to say about these chapters, just by way of background, is that two wives, it was explained to me, could also be called two wives and other alcoholics, sponsees, etc. <laughs> Anyone who has an alcoholic in their life. Um, and the other chapter that we're doing, the family afterward, is actually basically the same thing, except it, it deals more with group relationships. It's not just individual relationships, so it's really kind of the same thing. Um, and again, as I've gone through this and tried to practice it in my life and tried to learn more about it, I've found that these principles are universal principles that apply to any relationship, not just alcoholic relationships. So if you're in this room, this stuff can be helpful, at least, again, in my experience. Um, and what I've also found is what works on an alcoholic work on a normal person or non-alcoholic person much quicker. So um, <laughs> it's all good. Okay. So first thing, what I want to say, um, I'm going to have to look at my notes because my memory is pretty bad. Um, okay. What it was like. Um, so I'm going to talk first of all a little bit about what it was like for me, why I'm even here, why am I here even talking about this tonight. Um, in terms of my, my outlook on relationships and how I related to the world, my, to other people in the world. Um, uh, well, I guess from the early, earliest age I can remember, um, you know, I came from a, a sort of a nice, regular-looking family and uh, sort of middle class, everything looks okay on the outside. But I do remember feeling sort of separate. Um, I guess that's the only way I can really describe it, sort of separate from an early age. And for some reason, I always seemed to be included in stuff and things. I mean, if you looked at it, everything was sort of looked okay, but I, I remember feeling like I couldn't quite touch the situation. And um, But that really didn't cause me any huge problems until I picked up a drink, and I think it was connected to what happened. And what I feel like happened was something started to twist 
like something started to twist inside me when I when I started drinking. And and my story really is mainly about alcohol. I didn't get involved in a lot of drugs, so I know that alcohol in and of itself is enough to start that that going. But um, and or I, and, and basically what I what I think I did was I I picked people to be in my life that I felt would. Um, affirm me, uh, not reject me. Um, I strategically placed people in my life so that I could, you know, supposedly get what I thought I wanted or what I thought I needed, which was really, I think, just to, you know, affirm. Um, and it was not good because what was being affirmed was not real healthy. So, um, and I also, um, would take advantage of people. I mean, all of that is really connected. I mean, if you're looking at people as if they're objects or pieces on a chessboard, there's no way to connect with that as on a human level. It's all real heady, like real intellectual, like, ooh, how can I do this? Because I'm really scared and I feel really alone and I can't connect and I need someone to tell me I'm okay because I can't do that for myself. And that's kind of how I, how I came at things. Um, and it's sad. I mean, it's funny because I haven't really thought about some of this stuff in a long time, but, you know, knowing that I had to, to give this talk tonight, I started to remember some, some things. Um, and this really started for me, like I said, around the time I picked up a drink. Picked up a drink first around 13. Didn't really start drinking until I was about 18, but they say that when the first time you pick up a drink and it works for you, that's where your mental, um, your mental probably mental, mental, emotional, spiritual development stops. So, you know, we come into this program at whatever age. For me, I was 29, and uh, I was like 13, really. So, and I carried all of that, those coping skills, I guess, if you want to call them that, with me. Um, you know, I think about, um, you know, in high school, I would, uh, I would totally, like, I never thought that I, you know, everybody, <laughs> I'm one of those, like, every, a lot of people, maybe not everybody, but a lot of people come into the room and say, I didn't hurt anybody but myself. And I look back, and I, even in high school, I remember I would go out at night, and I would um, just, you know, drink and, you know, do what I wanted to do and not, I would have a curfew. I would just completely ignore it, and I would come home late. And my father would do this thing where he would call the cops, and the cops would be running around my town, and he'd be on the, in the bathrobe on the steps waiting for me mad. And um, for some reason, that just went completely over my head, like, you know, like it was just like, you know, like that, how annoying, you know, like what do you, you know, but that the cops were called running around. <laughs> I would just do this over and over and over again, and I did not even consider that that was painful for them. And um, so my family, and, you know, just family relationships were sort of like that. I really just assumed they would always be there. Like, they were my parents. They owed me. They'd always be there. I could abuse them. I could do whatever I wanted, and they would just take it. Um and uh, in terms of my friendships, like I said, I was uh, at some point I became kind of strategic about them. Like, you know, especially when it came to high school and older, when it came to you know, to guys, you know, I would pick women friends who I thought could get me closer to some guy I wanted to date, and even if it meant it was his girlfriend or, um, uh. You know, that kind of thing. So it was just real, all, all, all real strategic. And um, I would surround myself with people that I didn't think would reject me. And if they did, I didn't care. So I really um, wasn't coming from a really super healthy place. And they talk about sort of the results of that. And actually, I'm going to read something now, I think, if I can find it. I marked this stuff, and I still can't find it. Um, it's sort of the, the symptoms. Um, okay. We worry about what others think. We isolate. We avoid. We are paranoid. We are confused. We are fearful. We are self-centered and selfish and dishonest. Um, we're full of self-pity. We are vain. Um, but everything would be better if only we were this, if only we were that, if only we were more. 
more, more, more of whatever. Now, those are actually, according to this chapter, I don't know, if I asked you what they were symptoms of, what would you say? Would you symptoms of what? Does it sound familiar to... <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. Um, yeah, and but there are also, um, oddly enough, symptoms in this chapter uh, outlined is um, the other side of the coin, the people that we live with as alcoholics. They have the same exact symptoms. So it's important for us to see, at least I see it myself on both sides. I mean, I acted that way. And then what happened for me is when I came into the program and quit drinking, is I started noticing that I kind of quit acting that way. I started seeing, wow, that's really messed up. You know, that's, I don't want to hurt people like that. I was oblivious. I really wasn't doing it on purpose. I was just so scared and driven and afraid that I had to take care of myself. And I didn't know any other way, and that's what I was doing. I came into the program, I learned another way, and I slowly started to learn how to do things differently. But then I started attracting to my life the, the other side of it. So it was almost like, and, and it's fun, you know, it almost seems like to me like, you know, divine justice, because I think it's, in, you know, again, in my experience, we got to see both sides. In order to really get an understanding of what's happening, we have to see both sides. We have to feel both sides. So at least that's how I look at it today. So, and the results of that type of living usually looks something like this. And this is on page 105. Um, our relationships were battlegrounds. I don't know if you can relate to that, but I remember waking up in the morning very often feeling like I had to fight a war. I got to, you know, figure this out, fight this, beat this one, overcome that, this, this, this. Um, uh, we, our relationships were battlegrounds. Um, and we acted like nothing happened. And then we act, things would happen, and we acted like nothing happened. It was almost like we were taking a break. Okay, let's take a break from the battle, pretend like nothing happened. And then when the energy, you know, the ego wakes up again, gets a little more energy, we'll go back out and fight another, fight another day. Um, so the problems would blow over, but then they're repeated because they're never dealt with. They're just like swept under the rug. It can go on for years. Um, events were spoiled by our moods. We could not be with others. We could not be without others. Others could not be with us. And if you're here, probably you could, they could not be without you. Um, there was no financial or emotional or physical security. People got hurt. And yet we stayed. And yet we didn't change. So go figure. Why? Because we continue to lie to ourselves and justify dishonest behavior. So that doesn't sound very pretty, right? So that's that's kind of where at least I ended up. Um, so what happened? Um, um, what happened? I got sober in Montclair in uh, 1993, in March 1993. And, uh, you know, I remember hearing people say over time, they would say meetings uh, on March, whatever, 1993, I was separated from alcohol. And I used to think, well, that sounds strange to me. I don't, you know, I just, all I know is I you know, got the detox. But the more that I spent time in AA, I see what they mean because I had nothing to do with that. And the truth is, is that I knew it then. I knew then that day that I had nothing to do with it. And that is really honestly what's kept me here. But because I remember how, how weird that was. Because I had no intention of quitting drinking. I had no intention going to detox that day. I had no intention. I had all, you know, sort of planning my next escape from reality, all the trouble I got myself into, which I won't get into right now, but, um, and so, but I ended up in, 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 you know, in getting sober. So that's what happened. And what I've learned since, you know, I, you know, I, well, it's been a while since I, you know, came in. So a lot's happened in that time. But, um, one of the things I learned is that, um, is that the steps are preparation. The steps don't fix us. The steps are preparation for the, for the real work, which is actually life. Um, and part of that is giving it back to others. Part of that preparation is actually giving back to others. Um, that, for me, has, has to be incorporated into my life, just like eating, sleeping, working with others. It's just not an option. But um, I got into the program, and I, you know, work, you know, eventually through this and that and the other thing, you know, um, you know, have developed, my, have continued to to work on developing myself spiritually, and um, 
But along the way, I have to say that, you know, it, you know, it's a learning experience. We don't just get, I mean, I've learned a lot, but I have a lot to learn, and I've made a lot of mistakes, even in sobriety, as a matter of fact. I was talking to one of my sponsors tonight, and we were just like, man, it always gets worse when you get sober because you know how crazy you really are. So, um, you know, I had, uh, you know, I had uh, jobs where I, I took them for the wrong reasons. Um, you know, again, stayed in them for the wrong reasons. Battleground, I got to go. I, you know, I got to prove myself. Got to do all this. So it was just, you know, that continued well into sobriety, actually. And the whole strategic friend picking thing, you know, that went on for a while also. Until one by one, you know, at least, again, my experience is that I bottom out. I bottom out over and over again on these things because I don't, I cannot see the truth. Like, this is not working. It's just like one, it's like the drink goes. And then all the sort of physical things go, like the smoking and the this and the that. They start to go. Um, but then you start to see, well, you know, really, um, the talking about people, that's just as bad as picking up a drink. It's just another version of picking up a drink. The, the this, the that, all these things, all these character defects they talk about in here are versions of picking up a drink. So um, what they talk about in here is that, you know, basically, so what do we do? What is the solution? So that's what happened to me. I came into the program. I... I stayed sober. I've gr- gradually, gradually working on developing myself spiritually. I have had some experience with attempting to practice these principles in all my affairs the best of my ability. And here are some of the things that they suggest. And actually what might be helpful if you're sitting here um, listening right now is to put yourself, think of a, a situation, think of a person, or even if it's you, think of a situation, a challenging situation in your life right now where a relationship where the, these situa- these steps or these tips might apply. Um, and just ask yourself, do you do this? Okay, difficult situation. <laughs> Am I doing this? Okay, so it's actually on page 111 if you want to you know, go back to your book at some point. Um, these are what they call principles of success, living in the steps in relationships, how to behave in relationships. Um, and the truth is that you have to pretty much go through the steps in order to even be willing to do this. Because they are so, they go against our ego. And the steps are basically ego deflating propositions. They're principles that help us get right sized. And if you haven't gone through the steps, it's going to be pretty hard to actually incorporate this in any kind of real way in your life. That's why they come after the 12 steps. Um, one, never be angry. Okay. <laughs> You're all doing that one, right? Okay. <laughs> That that is actually tied to step one, uh, acceptance. Two, never tell others what to do. That's uh, one we're all probably practicing regularly also. Um, We don't have all the answers for other people. In fact, we don't have anybody else's answers. We barely even can figure out our own. Um, We share our experience, strength, and hope, and we let go of the results. Um, That's tied to step two. Three, we do not let bad, okay, well, actually, they're going to talk about, what they're going to talk about, first of all, let me go back for a second, is um, if you're really serious about getting better and changing and having better relationships, the first thing you have to do is stop. Stop. It's like stop the nonsense, start over. You're going to do it different. Okay, so that's the very first thing. And then they're going to give you all kinds of tips and suggestions, which basically come under one heading, which we'll get to at the end. To, to, to have a different experience in your life and your relationships, whether it be jobs, intimate relationships, family, friends, cars, anything you need to take care of, you know, anything that you're in, in the relationship with, anything that I don't even want to say the words take care of. I want to take that out, strike that. But anything that you're in relationship with. Um, but there is an exception, and I just want to point that out, because um, part of this is learning balance, and there's balance involved in here. Um, Do not let the bad behavior of another person control your life. Get on with your life. Be available for people who want your help. So it's like we have these tools and steps and um, principles that we can practice in our relationships, but at a certain point we have to, we have to be realistic. We have to be, and the truth is if you've gone through the ninth step very, very clearly, 
you're probably going to be in a situation where these are going to work and the exception is really going to be an exception. But it's just alerting us to the fact that there are some people that are not going to respond. It, they're not going to respond. And we have to be, uh, we have to, we have a responsibility to acknowledge that because if we're spending all our time with someone who's not going to respond, there's a lot of people out there around you that you cannot be useful to that want your help. So it's just part of being a sober person to um, be awake to that. Um, next one, do not try to reform. And that's kind of like, don't tell people what to do. Um, be helpful, not critical. People need to see their problems for themselves. Um, one of the things that's difficult about this process, because we go through, we learn things, we pass it on, people sometimes listen, sometimes they don't. A lot of times people have to go through and make their own mistakes before they realize why they shouldn't have done it in the first place. And that's okay. And it's, but, it, you know, we try to help each other not have to do that. But um, sometimes we, we have to let go. We don't tell people what to do. That this is what worked for me. If you want to do it, great. If you don't, good luck. But once you see it over and over again for many years, you start to kind of see that there's patterns to things that aren't going to work. So you share that, then you let it go. Um, there's a difficulty in sometimes seeing, foreseeing the consequences and actually, if you go back to the drinking part of the book, they talk about um, there's that strange mental blank spot where, you know, all of a sudden, hey, it wasn't that bad. That applies to lots of things, in and out of sobriety. Um, another thing, express concern. Create a safe environment. Let them know that you, you are worried, maybe worried needlessly, but the only reason you're sharing your your, opi your opinion, your, your experience is that you're, you're concerned. Um, ask them if they want your help before offering. <laughs> um, do they want it for themselves? When people feel obligated, they will get resentful. All of this, all of this stuff requires patience. And that's why, again, if you haven't really gone through the step work, it's going to be pretty hard to not be angry, never tell other people what to do, not let bad behavior ruin your life, to be helpful, not critical, to express concern, um, to not take things personally, um, to ask people if they want help, um, and to be patient. Um, the next one, cooperate with enthusiasm. Don't force, never chase. Um, life is the best teacher. Eventually, they must act. In, in other words, and whether we're talking about drinking person or whether we're talking about just anything in a relationship, you know, eventually, if there's an issue in the relationship, and hopefully you're all thinking about a relationship right now, if there's an issue, eventually something has to give. Eventually something has to give. There are no structures. No external structures are permanent. Eventually something has to give. And usually when it gives, it's not pretty, especially if you're an alcoholic. Um, we develop a new sense of responsibility. We think about what we can bring to the relationship, not what we can get out of it. And that's really the theme that I was trying to describe when I was describing myself, drinking and, you know, even into sobriety, constantly coming back to what can I bring, what can I bring, and not what can I get, what can I get. It doesn't work. It's not a value judgment. It's not a moral, you know, condemnation. It just doesn't work. Um, if you can find it that it works, please let me know, because I, I just honestly have tried that. <laughs> it doesn't work for me. Um, so think about what you can bring and not what you, you're trying to take. Um, and basically the theme of all of these principles uh, falls under something you may have heard, which is attraction, not promotion. So basically we, we bring what we want to get. And we, we're tolerant, we're patient. I mean, I don't know about you, but I want those things in a relationship. I want people to be tolerant of me. I want people to be patient with me. I want people to not tell me what to do. I want them to let me make my own mistakes. I want them to tell me if they see me about to crash into a, a pole. But, but if I you know, need to crash into a pole, I guess I'll have to do that. But I want those things. So if I bring those to the relationship, that's the only way I'm going to be able to have even a chance of getting them back. And the exception says you may not even get it then. But what kind of person do you want to be? You've got to live with yourself more than anything. So it's not about what the other person does. It's about what you do. Um, and there's actually a few paradoxes in this book because they say, you know, there's the exception, but never give up hope. 
which is really lovely. And actually, one of my favorite lines in this book is on page 104, where it says, We want to leave you with the feeling that no situation is too difficult and no unhappiness too great to be overcome. So how can we do all this? Okay, first of all, I think it comes back to developing a relationship with a God because certainly I can't do all this. I definitely have to have help from a higher power, higher intelligence. So how do we create a new atmosphere? Um, Here's some suggestions that they have from the book. Um, Looking at page 115. Creating a new atmosphere in your life, you know, for your relationships, again, of any kind. Um, We don't explain or justify our behavior. That doesn't mean we don't, if you're in a relationship, I mean, depending, I guess, on the, the, the degree of closeness of the relationship. I mean, as you get closer in a relationship, you tend to share more things. I mean, that's what it's about. So it doesn't mean we don't, we don't share, share things about one another, but we don't have to, we don't justify our behavior. We don't do something bad, say, blah, 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 blah. You know, that's, that's explaining and justifying. We, we don't do that. That does not create a safe atmosphere. Um, we're honest. We're respectful. We do not run away from problems. We do not take sides, but we do take responsibility. We do not lie for others. This Lying for others actually comes from a, a desire to protect. The problem is that if it's based on dishonesty, it's not going to work. Um, we talk to people when we know they're receptive. We don't force ourselves on people. <laughs> Have you ever tried to talk to someone when they're drinking about not drinking? That's a really extreme example. <laughs> but um, there's other examples of that. Sometimes people are just not in the mood to talk about something serious, and we have to respect that if we want to create a new atmosphere. If we don't, then just, you know, talk whenever you want. <laughs> um, ask how you can help let go of the past. We don't keep bringing up old stuff every time, every five minutes, just to win a, pa- just to win a point. You know, it's like tennis. You know, I, oh, my point, your point. We don't do that. Um, we regard problems um, in a different light, which means that we take a spiritual perspective on our problems, which means that we ask ourselves um, uh, the question, if I was to look back at all the things that happened in my life that seemed horrible and hard and really painful at the time, but turned out to be really good things, would I have picked them for myself? And I know for me that I, the things that I've really that I've grown the most from, I would definitely not have picked for myself. Um, I've had some fun with things I picked for myself, but definitely did not, I would say, bring me the the spiritual understanding and development and growth and basically peace and happiness that the things that were maybe more challenging did. So that's taking a spiritual perspective. In other words, it's not judging the situation as good or bad, basically, pretty simply. It's just what it is. And, you know, what I make of it is what I make of it. And that's where free will comes in once you've done the steps. What I make of whatever's going on is where I can use my free will. Um, in other words, how can I share my experience to help others in the bottom line? Like, how can I take this difficult situation and use it to be helpful to others? Um, everyone has a right to their opinion. Um, but when we disagree, t- try to disagree with 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 a, um, a healthy spirit, with not without resentment. We don't try not to disagree with others with resentment. Um, we stop triggering people on purpose. Um, we cooperate. We don't criticize. Um, we validate people's feelings. Um, and we thought, you know, we thought we could do all of these. We thought we could, you know, have all the things that we wanted in our relationships by being more. And basically what I'm learning more and more over time is that we get better relationships with ourselves, higher power, friends, family, partnerships, jobs, everything by being less. It's not about being more. It's about being less. It's about we were completely backwards. We think we're not enough. We're, we're, we're exactly how we're supposed to be. And what, what's in the way is the extra. So it's not like we have to get more. We have to let go of the stuff that isn't working. And actually that's a lot easier. That's actually... Good news. Um, it's hard to it's hard to get more than enough. It really doesn't even make sense. Um, 
So the promises that come out of these type of uh, actions are barriers fall. You will find a new courage, a good nature. Your good nature and lack of self-consciousness will be attractive to others. And you you will you know come out of a world of isolation into a world of cooperation. You know, again, what you bring, you you receive back. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the obstacles that we might face. Um, impatience. These things take time. I mean, if you think about it, most of us drank, drugged, whatever we did for quite a long time, and those patterns are repetitive, 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 repetitive. They get stuck and they they get ingrained. They take a while to unwind. When I was talking about twisting, it's like it untwists, like the untwisting has to take place. So it takes a while. So impatience is an obstacle we will face. Um, um, irritation and resentment leading to disagreements. Um, resentment and self-pity. Uh, jealousy of the attention paid to other alcoholics. And that's specifically talking, of course, to people who come into AA and their families. Like, how come you're helping people? What's going on? You're never home. Um, but it could be really jealousy of attention to anyone. Um, comparison, expectation. Impatience is a big one. And um, I have found one of the best tools to deal with these things, if you can remember to do it, and I think the more you just remember to do it, the more you remember to do it, it's really simple and it's really powerful and it works every time is pause so if you have an irritation pause take a break if you feel resentful and self full of self pity pause and count your blessings if you're jealous if you're if you're uh, annoyed if you're if you're anything pause and ask for direction So I guess the bottom line here is that the solution is place everything in God's hands. And how do we do that? We we practice. We practice understanding, patience, tolerance, kindness, love. And we, we, we learn how to do that by basically going through the steps. So really what you can see here is that this is a continuation of the steps for help for helping us live our life basically living our life is living in relationships so it's helping us to live our life um, I just want to say a few things also on um, the family afterward which again a lot of the principles that you're going to find in the family afterward are very similar to the ones you're going to find in two wives but again it speaks more to group dynamics and actually one of the key messages that comes out of this um, this chapter which I love is what you put before your sobriety you will lose but what you put into your sobriety, you will get back a hundredfold. Um, and again, I'm just going to read through some of these things. And again, if you think about a relationship in a group that you may be struggling with right now, this might be helpful. Um, putting the past to good use is key to our spiritual transformation. We temper our talk of others with understanding, compassion, and tolerance. Um, uh, we have to be uh, aware that all, and they, again, they're talking about alcoholics here, but everybody, everybody everywhere really, are just going through their phases of development. So when we're at work or at home and we're having challenges with people, um, if we can remember that everybody is in a different phase of their development, um, you know, in my work, I work with a lot of people who aren't in the program, but they are going through a phase of development. And one of the things that they struggle with a lot is thinking everybody thinks like them. And that's like the biggest obstacle, just thinking, well, why don't they do it like I do it? I don't understand. Like, what's up with that? You know? <laughs> um, so we have to realize that when we're talking to someone, like, be really, you know, present. Because otherwise we're going to be talking to our head. Talking to ourselves. And that's not a relationship, really. Um, we do not strain every nerve 
to get things. One of the things they talk about in this chapter is there's two things they actually point out, but it's really anything you put before your sobriety you will lose. The two things they talk about specifically are jobs and um, you know spiritual. Mm, uh, I, say, I can't think of the word intoxication. I think they say. So when people, um, you know, I, I suffered from the first one. Actually, I was just like, I want to get everything back. You know, I, I'm in debt and duh, duh, and I, you know, I have to prove myself. I was such a jerk. I have to prove myself now and show the world that I'm really not a jerk. And so I was running around and trying to be successful. And, make, and, and, and meanwhile, making crazier and crazier decisions in sobriety. So. Um, that was sort of my experience, but they also talk about when people come in and they're just like, woohoo, you know, I'm sober and I'm stoned off this stuff and I know all the answers and I'm helping people, blah, blah, blah. but you know, I'm, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a guru and I'm this and that, but the thing is, is that <laughs> the truth is, is that we got to live like, we live, you know, they say in here, our work is to be done you know, amongst our, each other, like we're here to help each other. We're not here to be like, you know, you know, we, we you know, that's fantasy land. Um, and they actually think they say that somewhere, something about those of us who have suffered from spiritual fantasy land have seen that it doesn't work. Um, it's nice to have, you know, good feelings, good vibes, you know, whatever, but this too shall pass and we have to love it all. You know, we have to love it all. Um, we don't push headlong into things. Material success always follows spiritual success. Um, Everyone must do it for the group to stay strong. And that can be any group. Any team you're working on at work, in AA, if the, everyone in the program isn't working, that's why we encourage each other to do this stuff, because if everyone isn't doing it, the group is not going to survive. It will fall, it, I've seen it over the years. Like, gung-ho, everybody gets crazy, falls apart. It's just how it goes. So we, everybody has to work the program. You know, they talk about um, what binds us. What binds us is not the problem. We come together because of the problem. What binds us is the solution. So that that's how we stay strong as a group. Everybody has to do it. Um, delusion is replaced by a sense of purpose. Um, so that's a promise. Um, and what we get out of this, we, we you know, delusion is replaced by a sense of purpose. Um, as a group, we learn compromise, balance, and service. And we can learn also how to enjoy ourselves. I don't know about you, but that's not was not one of my strengths. And I still will strive. You know, how do I, I'm not sure how to do that really well. Um, very serious, you know. So, and it, you know, it makes sense. You can come from kind of environments that trains us to survive, to you know, by being serious, at least for me. But we can learn to enjoy ourselves. And first of all, I know at least... Serious as I can be sometimes, I did not get sober to be miserable, and I would not be sober today if I was miserable. So, um, and, and it's our responsibility, to, actually, it's our responsibility as sober people not to be miserable, because who's going to want it if we're walking around miserable? And really, we don't stay sober unless other people want it. We do not get to stay sober unless we give it away, and if they don't want what we have, Everybody dies. So it's like kind of cool, really, when you think about it. It's our responsibility to be happy, joyous, and free. That's your new, um, that's your new job. You go out and be happy, joyous, and free. But one of the ways, <laughs> one of the ways we learn to do that is by learning to, to work in groups, you know, working together to enjoy ourselves, to do fun things. Um, we avoid deliberate mis- misery. You know, our misery is of our own making, and that's another way of saying drama. So we try to stay out of drama. It's not fun after a while. Um, um, and some of the promises that come out of that, again, barriers fall, lack of self-consciousness, lack of fear, worry, lack of hurt feelings. Um, a better way of life will emerge. If you surrender, you will win. You will make mistakes, but if you are earnest, you will capitalize on them. You are now working in partnership with life toward an undreamed of future. So they're saying, look, you know, we, we do the steps and we don't get we don't get problem free, but at least we have tools to deal with them. And the more again, the more you put into it, the more you're going to get out of it. And that's been my experience over the over time. I mean, when I when I first came into the program, I was not putting in nearly as much work into my program as I do today. And I'm having a whole different experience. So my whole thing is, why wait? You know, I had I was one of those people who had to learn things the hard way. And it's not such a bad thing if you can survive it. Um, not everybody does. So, um, uh, 
Um, let's see. So what is it like now? Um, so what it's like now basically is that, uh, you know, I live completely differently. I don't see the value in strategically picking my friends. I don't see the value in taking people for granted. I don't see the value in hurting people for fun. I don't see the value in any of the stuff that I used to see the value in. Um, because I have a higher power in my life and I know that if I do the right thing, I will be taken care of. Um, not in my time, but in God's time. I have 100% faith that that is the truth. That's been my experience, so I can say that with some kind of confidence. Um, I don't, my life doesn't look perfect every day, but it is perfect in the sense that I'm getting the lessons I need to grow. And um, I know for sure, you know, one of the things that I was blessed with when I came here, like I said, I felt like I was removed from alcohol. Um, I knew deep down, really early on, even before I came in, actually, that I was an alcoholic. And, um, and, uh, I have no, uh, no doubt in my mind that if I wasn't working this program, I would be probably dead, and if not dead, in really bad shape. So, um, and I'm not doing, and I don't work this out of fear. I'm not saying I work this program out of fear, but I'm saying I'm, I work it out of gratitude. This is a miracle that I'm standing here, um, you know, based on all, all the, the craziness that, uh, that's gone on and how I used to live and take care of myself and, and all that kind of stuff. And one of the, one of the other things, you know, I guess I'll just say too, is that one of the ways that we find out this stuff works is by, by making mistakes. Like we're going to make mistakes. So the book outlines some ideas for us. We have some ideas. Okay. Try this, try that, you know, don't be angry, try to cooperate, try to be helpful, try not to criticize, da, 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 try to do these things. And the promise is that your life is going to get better. Um, and I heard a speaker say something that I thought was really powerful, and I guess I had thought this for a long time, but I was really never able to put it into words, and it really, really gave me some clarity on, um, like they say, when, you, when you're really clear, like a lot of the work I do in my work work is helping people get clear on what they want, clear on what's important to them, clear on what their vision is, because once you know that, decisions are really easy. Like something happens, you're like, no. Something ha- yes. You just know, because that doesn't line up. That does not line up with who I am or what I want to be. Sometimes it's what I want to be, because they're still working on it. But um, the clearer that we can get on that, um, and we're going to do the vision for you at some point, um, the better. And the way that the speaker I heard uh, said was that, you know, what he has today is is a covenant. He has a covenant with his higher power. He has a covenant with God. The covenant is an agreement. And the agreement is, like he said, he doesn't have... A commitment so much to he's married he was a married guy so he, he you know he loved his wife and he was very complimentary and thought she was the greatest thing on earth and met was the right person and all that kind of stuff he said truly the the truly the commitment was to the relationship truly there was the commitment to playing his role truly the commitment was to being a good husband because that's what he felt his role was because you know what shows up is what we're supposed to be doing according to i mean if you believe that, you know, everything is exactly as it's supposed to be, then what shows up is what we're supposed to give our all to at that time. And if we give our all and it still doesn't work, then that's the exception. But um, he said he has a covenant with his higher power, and, um, you know, that made it really easy for him to go through his life and make clean decisions because if it didn't, confer- if it didn't line up with, um, you know, is it honest, is it honest, you know, to the best of his ability to see it, then it had to go um, if it wasn't, you know, whatever. You know, so that's why, again, going back to the original step work, we do 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. All of that is helping us to see what's important to us, what no longer works, what works, what's important to us. We do the relationship ideal and all that kind of thing. I mean, it's all connected. But um, so that for me was really helpful just to say, okay, you know, truly that's what it is about for me today. Um, it's not about, I mean, in, you know, I've sort of been lucky in an unlucky way. I mean, I got a lot of stuff on the outside at first and things sort of happened for me really quickly and I felt better. And, uh, and then I learned also pretty early on that it wasn't about that stuff. And you put it before your program, you can't keep it. Um, and, you know, some lessons take longer to learn than others because there's deeper levels of understanding that we have to get to. Um, 
And again, I'm just going to put one more plug in for, for the step work about getting really, really, um, it will help you with this part of the book if you do a really thorough, um, if you do your step work really, really thoroughly and get really, really clear on what's going on in your primary relationships. But what I've learned is that really my life is completely, everything that happens in my life is completely dictated really by my connection with my higher power. And I had to learn a lot about that through uncovering where I still held on to fear in other relationships. And the closer they are, the more information they contained for me. So um, thank you so much for having me here. I hope, you ha- I, hope I have brought you a good message. And um, um, have, a, have a wonderful evening. We have about um, five minutes if anybody has any questions or otherwise we'll, we'll just close. close a little early. Well, this is something that I've always done, but it's something that was brought to my attention, and I th- definitely think it's a really good idea. I mean, especially the more p- people that I work with, the more that I see that it has come up as an issue. And actually, I think Bill is the first person I heard it from. He said, you know, really it's helpful to get to know the people's family and help them and, uh, you know, give them some guidance. And I, and I have done some of that, but um, but more and more I, I see the value in doing that. I mean, tonight I was trying to talk more about relationships and recovery in a, in a broader sense, but um, because, again, I think the principles apply to all our, all our relationships, uh, whether they're alcoholic or not. Um, but, yeah, no, I, I definitely think it's helpful. The, the challenge is, like with the alcoholic, and we talked about how the, the qualities are the same on, really on both sides in terms of the symptoms, can be very similar, um, is, you know, again, the willingness or interest in seeing the need and all that kind of thing. So, that, you know, I've run into that quite a bit. Okay, have a nice way of closing. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.